the sin of pride. Today I want to talk to you about this issue in the Bible, and we're going to see what the Bible has to say about pride. And I'm going to tell you right up front, um, pride is a word that you should remove from your vocabulary if you're a Christian, unless it's in condemnation. Um, you'll not find any references in your King James Bible to pride being a good thing, or proud, you know. Every time you see the word pride or proud or prideful, it's always negative. So you should try and get that thing out of your uh, vocabulary. A good replacement would be, I'm well pleased. You know, you don't say, I'm proud of this. You say, I'm well pleased with this. Or the Lord has blessed me with such and such. Okay? But how do you define pride? Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, Pride. Inordinate self-esteem and unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishments, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt of others. Okay? And then it goes down through a bunch of different examples there, which we're not going to talk about because I'm going to be covering a lot of these scriptures. But the second one there is insolence, rude treatment of others, insolent exaltation. Okay, so what do you have there with pride? You have somebody that thinks that they're better than other people. Somebody that says, well, I make lots more money than that person over there. Or, I, I know the Bible better than that person over there. Or, whatever. You think that you're better than other people. And, you know, some people might be. You know, some of these prideful people might actually be better than someone else in some other area or whatever. But the point is, as a Christian, a Christian trait, you should be humble, not prideful. If God has done things through you and with you and f for you, and you know, if God's done things with you, you should be humble about that. Okay? You should not be proud. You should not go around boasting yourself and, and you know, and, and I got to say this too, you know, because there's a thing people will say, you should never be rude as a Christian. Well, Brethren, you're going to come off as being rude sometimes when you speak absolute truth. All right? You should speak it in love. I understand that. You should be kind, you know, and, and considerate of other people's feelings, not wanting to be cause strife or contention. I understand that. But there's a sense in which you're never going to be right with everybody. Okay? There's a sense in which no matter what you do, no matter how nice you are, kind you are, whatever, people are still going to consider you to be rude. All right? So watch out for that thing there of, oh, you know, you shouldn't be rude in things as a Christian. But if your rudeness comes from you being prideful, then yeah, it's a sin. All right? If you are very rude and you're very arrogant because you look down your nose at people and you're like, oh, well, <laughs> you're not as educated as I am or, you know, you're not as rich or as wealthy as I am or whatever, then that's sin. That's sinful pride. Now, what was the first act of pride in the Bible? Go to Genesis chapter 3. If you know your King James Bible, then you probably know where I'm going with this thing. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Okay, it says here, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God never said that, you, that they weren't allowed to touch it. Okay? Eve added to the word of God. First of all, you have Satan coming and putting doubt into her mind, saying, Yea, hath God said. And then she adds to the word of God. You know why you do that? You know why people add to the word of God? Because they're proud. They're too prideful to humble themselves and say, I submit myself to this book that's 402 years old. They don't like that. You know, it looks makes you look bad. It makes you look stupid. Oh, you're one of those King James only people. You know, uh, yeah, I am actually. King James Bible believer. But continuing here, verse 4. And the woman said unto this, uh, I'm sorry, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So he denies God's word there. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, oh boy, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband 
with her, and he did eat. Now you read back there, I think it's in 1 Timothy, it says Adam was not deceived. The reason Adam ate of the tree was because he realized that his wife now was under the death penalty of God. So he said, I don't want my wife to die, and me not die with her. So Adam took of the fruit, knowing what she had done. Okay, But you see there, why did she take of the fruit? Because of pride. Because she was lifted up, her ego was lifted up. Satan said, you can be like God. You can be as a God, knowing good and evil. You can be wise. Don't you want to be wise? PhD, THD, THM, doctor, you know. See? And what are most of those people? These guys that go around saying, I'm Dr. So-and-so, you know, Dr. Smarty Pants, you know. And uh, what are they? They're proud. Very, very, very prideful. And I'm going to show you this in this study. That's a very, very bad thing. If you want to be used of God, you cannot have pride in your life. You can't do it. Okay? You say, well, can I have pride in the things that, you know, of the Lord and things? That's not the word to use. Okay? Pride has a very negative connotation to it in your King James Bible. You need to avoid it. Leviticus chapter 26. We'll go there next. Next. And we'll actually see the very first time that pride shows up in your King James Bible. We saw what pride looks like there with Eve. But now we're actually going to see here Leviticus chapter 26 verse 14 is where we'll start. And you can read. We're not going to read all these verses. But if you go down through first through verse 14 through verse 43, you'll see a good description of a nation that God is against and that God judges. And you'll see why God judges them. But we're going to read here just a few verses, verses 14 through 20. It says here, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, see again, there's that problem with the Word of God, submitting yourself to the authority of God's Word. See, you know, Lowering your pride and coming down and saying, God, I'll submit to you. A lot of people don't want to do that. That's why they call themselves atheists. Most people who are atheists, you know, in America, I know that there are people in other countries that it's atheistic, you know, communism that's taught there, and they've never actually heard about the Bible. And many people like that, they hear about the Bible, they study the Bible for the first time, and they say, I need to be saved. I know that there's a God, I know this is His book, you know. But most people in the in the America or the UK or whatever that the English speaking world, most of those people that claim to be atheists, they're doing it because they're convicted by this book. They don't want to know uh, that there's a book out there that says you're a sinner and you're going to hell. That's why a lot of those people reject the word of God. But continuing here, verse 15, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. Hmm. You know the root cause of this whole terrorism problem? You know why? Because people don't want to, to obey and submit to the word of God. That's why. And is the terrorist problem real? Yeah, it is. There are terrorists, but most of them are in suits and ties and, and work in political offices. But it says here, I even appoint, I will even appoint over you terror, cons consumption and the burning egg or ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. You'll be overtaxed, in other words, basically. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will uh, make your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain. Uh, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Now, notice there in verse 19, I will break the pride of your power. It was very interesting, after 9-11, I remember seeing all these vehicles driving around, and these people had bumper stickers that said, the power of pride. Little American flag, you know, you can see it here. I have a picture of it up. The power of pride. 
And I thought, that is about the most stupid thing that there ever was. You know, here comes the, ter the terrorists, you know, they're coming in, they're going to attack again, and you say, hey, whoa, hold on. I have pride. Don't you attack me. I have the power of pride. And the terrorist goes, oh, oh I didn't realize you had pride. Oh, I, I, okay, I, I'll leave you alone. Please don't hurt me with your pride. <laughs> what is the power of pride? What does that do? That shows ignorance. How about this one? Pride equals power. Isn't that a nice little button? Don't you just want to put that thing on your lapel? You know? And, you know, have this nice little rainbow thing, you know? And, you know, I'm going to be a Christian and I like to have little rainbows around me and things like that. And, you know, I watch out for Christians that have rainbow motifs and things on their channels and websites and stuff like that. The rainbow is God's symbol of judgment. Okay, It's his symbol of a covenant that he made there with with Noah that he's not going to again destroy the earth by a flood. Um, and so the Sodomites come and they say, oh, we'll use the rainbow as our symbol. You know, that's pretty bad. But the fact of the matter is, America is filled with pride and this nation is about to be broken by God. I've been saying it for a long time and you say, well, you've been saying it and, you know, it hasn't happened yet. Oh, actually, yes, it has. You see, there's a quick destruction, and then there's a slow, gradual, downward spiral. And that's what America is right now. You know, more and more people are losing their jobs. More and more people, their health is falling apart. Um, people are having their, their finances depleted. Uh, all kinds of problems. Why? God's wrath is on this nation. Yeah, we can still preach the word. I, I, I appreciate that. You know, I'm glad for that. We can still get on the internet. We can still, you know, put out videos. We can still do a lot of things for the Lord. But God's breaking this country. And no country ever deserved it like America does. Turn next to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to see another example of pride. We're not going to be covering all the uh, references to pride in your King James Bible. You can do that some time on your own, but uh, just going to hit a couple of them here. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. Now, if you know the, st the story here, basically you have this guy named Goliath. He's this giant, and he was a real giant, by the way. Uh, he wasn't just um, slightly taller than the other people and things. No, this guy was an a offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. It was going on before the flood. It was going on after the flood. Okay, this guy was a part angel, part man. All right, listen to the angel's sermon if you want more on that. Uh, that is what the Bible teaches. They, the sons of God are not the sons of Seth or something like this, something ridiculous. Okay, they were creating huge giants as a result of the fact that they're supernatural beings mingling with flesh. But uh, sounds crazy, but then again, the Bible's a crazy book. But you have this giant there, and he's defying the armies of Israel, and everybody's too chicken to do anything about it. So what happens? David, who later becomes King David, comes down to the battlefield, and he says, I can beat this guy out there, this Goliath. You know, just a young man, you know, I can beat this guy out there. And here's what happens. Verse 28. It says here, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Okay, so his older brother is saying, You prideful little punk. What do you think you're doing coming down here? Oh yeah, you're going to slay the giant. Oh boy, yeah, yeah, you little proud little little jerk, you know, and David says, hey, what have I done, you know, isn't there a cause here? In other words, why am I the only one that's saying this? All you big, brave, bad guys out here, haven't, well, how come you haven't taken care of him yet? You know, it's kind of funny, it reminds me of like a lot of the brethren here on YouTube, you know, 
they'll put out messages that these guys, these a lot of the big name, you know, pastors out there, they wouldn't touch some of the controversial issues that my brothers in Christ talk about, you know. Why? You know? Well, because they're part of big building systems and they have paychecks and everything else that they have to worry about. You know, just kind of an interesting little jab I had to put in there. But uh, look down at verse 45. David, of course, does go to battle with Goliath. But uh, it says here, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now let me just stop there before we continue. Notice, if David really truly was prideful, like his older brother said, David would have come and he would have said, Hey, you up there, I bet you I can beat you. I mean, after all, I lift weights and things, and I, I'm really in good shape. And I mean, I have this really nice sword I just got down at the local sword shop. And I, I mean, I, I'm very good with this sword. And after all, I mean, I'm really something else. And I'm, I'm going to teach you a lesson. But he didn't do that. He said, I'm come from the God of Israel. The Lord is going to deliver you into my hands. Okay? He gives God the glory. See, that's not pride. And when you as a Christian, when the lost world says, oh, you think you're so smart, you think you're going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell, you say, yes, I am going to heaven. And if you're not saved, you're going to hell. You know why? Not because I'm a good person. Not because I've done something of my own merit but because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross to pay for my sins, His death, His burial, His resurrection, to justify me and give me an eternal inheritance in heaven. I can't boast of anything. It's all Jesus Christ and what He did for me. See? See, that's not pride. Now, if I said, well, of course I'm going to heaven. I'm a highly educated, uh, very intelligent person. And I'm very, very good. I mean, I've... I'm not a drunkard. I'm not a murderer. I'm, I'm a very, very smart, wonderful, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's pride. But boasting in what Jesus Christ has done, that's not pride. And giving glory and honor to the Lord, that's not pride. But let's continue here. What happens to Goliath? Verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Ran toward the army of the enemy. Boy, you got to get a hold of that one. That's pretty neat. In other words, he was offensive in his warfare. He didn't wait for the enemy to come to him by building a building and inviting the lost to it. He went out against the army of the Philistines. Hmm. But, uh, verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Gotta love that. You know, here's this giant, and he's got all these weapons and everything else. And David's there, and he's got the little piece of leather, a little, you know, string of leather and a little, you know, part in the middle there that you put the stone in, and you sling it around, and you, <laughs> you know, boom, right into the head. Down he goes. You know, pretty amazing. But uh, verse 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith, and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. I heard a guy say the one time jokingly, he said, that's how you get a head in life. I thought that was pretty good. You know, and it's just like, what happened there? Well, David gave God the glory. And then he said, okay, now I put my faith in the Lord, what he's going to do. He's going to slay you, and I'm going to give God the glory. 
and he ran towards the army. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are into soul winning ministry, you know, you should give God glory for the thing. And a lot of that soul winning stuff gets kind of carnal. You know, you read a lot of these old things. We had, you know, 40,000 saved in, in a day, you know, and all this stuff. Preached to millions of people, you know, and blah, blah, blah. You know, I know it's in the book of Acts. I know that it records how many people got saved. But the whole thing is it's it's like the Lord recording it. It's not really that Peter's going around saying, we had 3,000 people saved on the day of Pentecost. Praise God, you know. No, I mean, that stuff can get kind of carnal. I mean, if you're putting out tracks and things like that, you know what I would do? Don't even count them, you know. I mean, I, I, I've done this stuff. I mean, I, you know, I'm just giving you some instruction in righteousness. Just hand them out, you know. Give them to people, lay them out, whatever, and let the Lord give the increase, you know. You don't have to prove that you're some militant soul winner out there by counting the number of conversions that you've had and whatever else. Give God the glory. You go out, run into the enemy there, run into the enemy territory, go into the city, go into the, you know, wherever, where the Lord tells you to go out and put out tracks, go witness to people, go out there and give God the glory for it. Okay, that's what you can learn from that story there. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 32. We'll go there next. Second Chronicles 32. Failed to mention here at the beginning of this, um, we're in here inside again today because it's been raining off and on. It's, the sun was out there just a minute ago just looking outside, but uh, it just keeps on raining so didn't want to go out and risk the chance of getting my Bible wet. I have a waterproof King James Bible New Testament, which wouldn't have helped me today because we're in the Old Testament a lot, but I don't have waterproof notes, so uh, that wouldn't quite work. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 24 says here, In those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. And Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. See the pride there? Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Notice that. It wasn't that God said, okay, then I'll just never punish Jerusalem. You know, I'll never punish Judah and Jerusalem because you humbled yourself and I, you know, you turned from your wickedness and things, so I'm never going to punish. No, he just simply said, I'm not going to punish in your days, Hezekiah, because of the pride that he had, he actually humbled himself. And you know, God has spared America for so long because there's a lot of Bible-believing Christians here and because we have humbled ourselves. And yeah, we're seeing judgment. Yeah, we're seeing things starting to fall apart. America's starting to be broken. But the way you preserve it is by humbling yourself. Not by being prideful. Not by going around strutting your stuff and saying, Oh yeah, I have constitutional rights. Bless God, I'm a patriot. And all this other stuff. That doesn't do it. That doesn't cut it with the Lord. The Lord is not interested in the United States Constitution. He's not interested in the Bill of Rights or anything else. Okay? The Lord is interested in a broken and a contrite spirit. He's interested in humility. Which we're going to see here as we continue. Job chapter 41. Job 41 verse 1. Cover this. Uh, this past week in the study on smoking, and uh, talked about Leviathan, Leviathan being a type of Satan. Job 41, verse 1, to get in the context here. Uh, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or to his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Okay, so Leviathan is basically given as a fire-breathing dragon in this chapter. You can read about that. All right, but uh, jump down to verse 15. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. So you have this dragon 
basically, and his scales are so close together, you're not going to get an arrow in there, you're not going to get a sword or a spear in there. So how does that make that this creature Leviathan feel? Makes him feel strong, makes him feel like he's invincible, which leads to pride. And you know, when you start to have that attitude in this life, when you find somebody that has that attitude, that knows everything, and they are in good physical shape, and they start to feel like they're invincible, you know what it leads to? Pride. When you have somebody who's been through some sickness, and they've been through some hard times, and they know what it's like to suffer a little bit, you'll find somebody who's humble. Humility. Which is kind of a rough thing as a Christian, because that means that quite oftentimes God's going to let you be going through some sickness. Quite oftentimes God's going to let you suffer a little bit to keep you humble. See? Yeez. It's rough, isn't it? God doesn't want you feeling invincible down here because then you don't give Him glory. You start to take pride for yourself and think that you're really somebody. You know? But look down to verse 33. Job chapter 41, verse 33. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Hmm. That's interesting. So his children have pride. Let's take a look at Satan's children, who they are. John chapter 8. Turn to your New Testament. John chapter 8. John 8, verses 43 through 47. And you won't have to be on YouTube very long. If you make videos, you'll discover some of these children. There's a lot of them on YouTube. Okay. You'll see them in the comments on these videos. Uh, sometimes I don't approve them because they're just putting links into videos that attack me or, or uh, that it will lead people astray or, or they'll use profanity and things. So a lot of times I don't, you know, approve their comments. Uh, most comments I try to approve, you know, if they're not too ridiculous. But uh, John chapter 8, verses 43 through 47 says, Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil. Remember it said he's a king over all the children of pride? See? And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Now look at this one. He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, here's a very important thing to understand. I fully understand that there are people out there that for some reason or another, they've fallen for these new versions. I understand that. I believe that you can be saved and use a new version. All right? Somebody gets saved, they're genuinely saved, they hear the gospel, whatever, and they go out to a, a you know, Christian bookstore, and they say, I'm looking for a Bible. Somebody sells them a new version. Okay? That's fine. But I believe that if the Spirit of Truth is there, he that is of God heareth God's words. When somebody who is genuinely converted, when they hear this book right here, it won't seem like, oh, I hate that book. It might seem strange at first. It might seem kind of like, huh, I kind of like the way that sounded, but boy, that seems kind of hard. But as you study it more and more and more, it becomes easier and easier, and the Lord shows you the interpretation of it. But when you get these people and they say, I'm a Christian, but I hate and despise the King James Bible. I'm sorry, I don't believe that those people are saved. They're not saved. Why? He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. He's talking to the children of the devil. And by the way, he was talking to religious people there. He wasn't talking to a bunch of atheists. Practicing atheists, maybe, but he was talking to the religious men of his day, the scribes, the scholars, you know, the people who tell you that the better rendering would be here and the King James translators didn't really know what they were doing and, and didn't know what they were talking about and things. See, those are those people. 
That's the crowd. You know what, what most quote-unquote Bible scholarship is today? This higher textual criticism, and I mean of the Alexandrian school of thought, you know what it is? It's based on pride. It's exactly what it is. Why? They don't want to believe in any Bible out there. People say, well, Brian, you attack the new versions. Yeah, and I offer you a perfect replacement. See, I don't say the King James isn't no good, the NIV is no good, the ESV is no good. None of them are perfect. Come to me because I'm a Greek and Hebrew scholar. I don't say that. I say none of the new versions are good, but go to the King James Bible and you'll have God's perfect word for you if you speak English. That's what I say. You don't need me to interpret the book for you. I can preach to you, I can teach you the Word of God, but when it comes right down to it, this is all you need right here. The King James Bible. That's all you need. See? And if you're of God, you'll hear God's words. You'll understand that I'm telling you the truth. And if you see I make a mistake, you go, well, you know, Brother Brian made a mistake there, but, you know, he's right on these other areas there. I'll follow him there and not where he made a mistake. Fine. Praise the Lord. You know? But you see, right there is the, the test. And when you get these people that don't believe in any Bible out there, and they're just, you know, telling you that the, this rendering should be this, and now the Greek word there should be blah, blah, blah. They're proud. You know? The Bible talks about back there in 1 Timothy chapter 6 about people being proud, knowing nothing, you know, doting about questions and strifes of words. Yeah. That's what those people are. Watch out for that. Okay. Now turn in your Bible back to Psalm 10. Psalm 10. We're going to start here in uh, verse 1. Read down to verse 8. It says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight, as for all his enemies he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Don't you love that? You say, America's going to be destroyed. A lot of these lost people are like, oh, come on. I've been hearing that for years. I'll never be in adversity. It's never going to get that bad. We're never going to have an economic collapse. All this end time stuff, it's not going to happen. Come on. I'll never be in adversity. There they're being described. Verse 7, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. It's interesting because these corrupt people, not only do they want to rip other you know, rich people off, but they specifically go after the poor. That's the, one of the marks of a really bad society when people are trying to take advantage even of the poor. But uh, you see the thing there again of pride. Pride being a very bad thing. Um, turn next to Psalm 31. Psalm 31, uh, verse 19. Okay, it says here, O oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. I thought that was kind of interesting, as you know, like the charismatics, the strife of tongues there. <laughs> but it's interesting there. When you fear God, when you're doing the work of the Lord, there's often times the Lord will hide you. I've seen that thing happen. You know, you're doing the work of the Lord and, you know, you're out there putting out tracks or you're, you're witnessing or whatever. Many times, the Lord will actually hide you. 
and it'll enable you to go into places and put those tracks down and you get out of there unscathed, untouched. You know, very interesting. But there it says about, you know, he'll, he'll uh, hide you in the, in the secret presence from the pride of man. You know, another interesting reference there to pride. Uh, very, uh, another thing here, James 4, chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humble. Okay? Uh, 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So you see there, you say, well, brother, I, I have some issues with pride. I, I just uh, really, I have some, you know, things I'm very proud of, and I, I have a hard time humbling myself. Okay, then God's going to resist you. It's just as simple as that. You have to humble yourself. Okay? You should be thinking of other people as better than yourselves. When you're going around thinking that you're really somebody, God's not going to use you. Okay, you have to take a humble position in life. Just the way it is. Psalm 59, verse 12. Psalm 59, verse 12 says here, For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Hmm. Very interesting because quite oftentimes the wicked will lie and curse against a humble Christian. They'll lie about you. They'll say things that you are saying that you never said. And they'll, they'll backstab you and gossip about you and do all sorts of things. And you know what's going to happen? God will take them in their pride. Very interesting. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. It says here, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. You know, one of the favorite little cliches that people like to use now is, quit hating on people, or, or why do you have such hate? Well, as a Christian, you're supposed to hate evil things. And it's kind of funny, too, because there's nobody out there that can truly say that they have no hate in their lives. You know, I just love everything. No, you don't. Hey, do you hate the flu virus? Well, if you have any sense, you do. You know, do you hate poverty? Do you hate sickness? Do you hate uh, having no food? Um, do you hate being out in zero degree temperatures uh, with no coat? You know, see, there are many things that you hate. You're to love good things, hate evil things. That's just common sense. People that tell that you, you that you're not to have any hatred in your life, they're mentally sick. Okay? And it's, it's very funny, too, because all these people that say about, you shouldn't hate, you shouldn't hate, you should have tolerance and things like that, they hate you as a Bible believer. And they like to, to silence you, you know, and, and keep, you, keep your mouth shut, you know. Very interesting, you know, they, they will not tolerate intolerance kind of thing, you know. Or uh, another little funny thing that they could probably say is, we hate hate crimes. You know, do you hate hate crimes? <laughs> See, th this whole politically correct movement is to get you away from the Word of God. It's to put people down and say, how dare you have beliefs in the Word of God? But it's interesting there, one of the words it says about the froward mouth. Froward, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, says, perverse, that is, turning from with aversion or reluctance, not willing to yield or comply with what is required, unyielding, ungovernable, refractory, disobedient, peevish, as a froward child. Okay? So the froward mouth there is basically a mouth of somebody who's completely disobedient. And, you know, oftentimes they'll take glory in their shame. 
got this little fly flying around me right now. I apologize for that. I'm not waving to anybody on the film here. You know, I'm just trying to get this rid of this stinking fly. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 11, verses 1 through 3. And here's another one that's a, a good kick, you know, against some of the brethren, and a, a good kick to all of us, really. Proverbs 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Hmm. A false balance is abomination to the Lord. You say, well, what's that about? Well, you know, if you go back far enough into history, you would have them, say, a farmer coming in with grain, and he goes and he, he puts it to, you know, to weigh it or whatever, or let's see how much you have, and uh, we'll, we'll weigh out uh, the money that we can give to you. you know, so they put some gold coins on there. The only thing is that they've reworked their scale to give a false weight. So when they should have earned 10 pounds of gold, we'll say, or 10 ounces of gold, we'll say 10 ounces of gold, the scale only says that they're owed eight ounces of gold. You say, well, we don't really have anything like that in the modern times, do we? Uh, well, yeah, actually we do. Uh, kind of like when you go to sell a vehicle, or when you go to sell something, and a person comes and says, is there any problems with this vehicle? No, 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 I runs great. Uh, in the back of your mind, you're saying, boy, I hope they don't ask me about that exhaust, because I know there's a leak in it. And it does use a lot of oil and things like that, but uh, boy, I'm going to try to sell it to them without them finding that stuff out. You see, that's not having integrity as a Christian. And I know it's real tempting, you know, when you get a junker, or some kind of vehicle, or some kind of thing that you need to get rid of, it's been a problem for you, and you want to sell it like it's never been a problem. But see, what is that? It's very similar to an unjust weight. And it's very, very difficult when you get somebody coming and you say, well, I'll tell you right now, um, this vehicle is going to have to be a fixer-upper because it has an exhaust leak. I'll show you where it's at. It's right down under there. See it? And uh, it does use oil. And um, the radio doesn't always work. You know, I don't know. There might be a wiring problem in there and things like that. But you know what I've seen sometimes? I've seen when you do that, and the person says, is there anything else? And you say, I, I really don't, I don't know of anything else. I can't guarantee anything on this vehicle. It has to be sold as is. I, I just want to be as honest as I can. You know, a lot of times that'll sell the vehicle better than you trying to cover it up. I've seen that thing. I've seen it. People, why? Because people can tell that you have integrity. That you're being honest with them. See? That's how we are supposed to live our lives as Christians. We're not supposed to be prideful, boastful, covering things up in false weights and things like that. We're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be honest. Lower your pride. Okay? That's what we're supposed to do. Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, verse 10. <clears throat> 